All right. Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Offshore Wind Roadmap Update presented by Maine Audubon. I am Nick Lund, and I'll be joined today by two colleagues and a special guest to update you on the latest happenings regarding offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine, including a current opportunity to, opportunity to offer feedback on Maine's path to realize the benefits and mitigate the impacts of offshore wind. In particular, we will be discussing progress on Maine's Offshore Wind Roadmap, a state initiative to guide the development of offshore wind, led by an expert advisory committee and working groups, including Maine Audubon staff. Uh, the roadmap focuses on a variety of topics related to the development of offshore wind, including energy markets, ports and infrastructure, socio socioeconomic benefits, uh, equity, manufacturing and supply chains, workforce development, and especially important to Maine Audubon, wildlife and environmental compatibility. Uh, each of the four working groups have developed a set of recommendations. Those recommendations are open to feedback for the public with comments due by April 30th, which is less than two weeks away. Among our goals today is to share the recommendations that are of great interest, greatest interest to Maine Audubon and encourage you, the listeners, to offer your feedback. Um, to talk in much more detail about the roadmap and the draft recommendations are my guests today. First is Selena Cunningham, the Deputy Director of the Governor's Energy Office. Hello, Selena. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. It is five after, so you can say good afternoon. So that's great. Um, also here, of course, is my colleague Sarah Haggerty, our conservation biologist and a GIS manager for Maine Audubon. Hi, Sarah. Hello. And finally, my colleague Eliza Donahue, Maine Audubon's Advocacy Director and our Offshore Wind Policy Lead. Hey, Eliza. Hey, Nick. Hey, everyone. Great. So we're going to get started. I'm just going to have to do my quick little tech rundown here. We are in webinar format, which means I cannot see you or hear you, attendees out there. Uh, we are recording this. It will be on Maine Audubon's website today or tomorrow. Um, if you, we're gonna talk for a bit and then we'll take questions from the audience, uh, from the, the people watching. If you have questions, please do not type them into the chat where we were just putting our towns. Instead, put them into the Q&A box down below and that's how we can make sure that, they, uh, that we see them when the time is right. Um, I think that's all I need to say. And now um, let's just get going. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Selena Cunningham for her opening remarks. Great, let me just go ahead and share my screen. How's that? Looks good. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Selena Cunningham. I'm from the Governor's Energy Office, um, which is working across state government and with private and public sector folks to um, work on renewable energy issues, including offshore wind. So I'll take um, just a few minutes to give you a little bit of um, background in terms of the state's work um, in um, offshore wind and then talk about the roadmap in a little bit more detail. So as you likely know, the um, state has, has some ambitious climate and clean energy um, goals that has been, have been put in place. In 2019, the state, the state set um, ambitious greenhouse gas reduction uh, requirements of 45% below 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% by 2050. And over the course of um, year plus put together a four year climate action plan that was delivered in um, at the end of 2020. And a part of that work is pursuing a number of strategies that um, are across the economy in terms of how to reduce climate emissions. One of those key areas um, that, that uh, is included is increasing renewable energy. That not only is important to, um, for the existing energy that we're using, but also as we need to electrify our transportation and uh, residential heating and, and homes, we will need even more renewable energy resources. So in the governor's energy office, we've put together a number of reports, um, including an energy, um, energy assessment, energy plan about how we are going to meet those goals. And what is clear is that we have a lot of available uh, renewable energy uh, potential in the state. Um, we also want to pursue a diverse, diverse portfolio. 
And so uh, whether that's a solar, large scale, small scale, um, onshore wind or offshore wind, and even in other energy sources, um, the state is taking a diverse approach. And a key part of that is offshore wind. Um, the, the Gulf of Maine has some of the highest sustained winds um, in, in the country in terms of available resources and has, um, I believe, over 156 gigawatts of potential energy from the Gulf of Maine. This can not only help uh, power the state of Maine, but also um, the rest of New England that has significant um, climate and renewable energy requirements as well. And so how the state has been doing this is we launched the Maine Offshore Wind Initiative uh, in 2019. And uh, this was, it was set up to explore how to responsibly uh, support the growth of the offshore wind industry, taking a look at strategic planning, research, and partnering across um, in, uh, with folks in Maine, the nation, and the world to support um, a responsible uh, development of the industry. I'm really looking at these four pillars, fighting climate change that I talked about, increasing renewable energy in the state, and then also supporting additive um, jobs and economic growth. Um, as we are seeing in Europe and also in south of uh, on the East Coast, the offshore wind provides a tremendous economic opportunity where we are exploring how the state can benefit not only from potentially projects in the Gulf of Maine, but participate um, in, in other um, where the projects are south of here as well in terms of our supply chain. And lastly, a key to this work is sustaining Maine's heritage, maritime heritage, and um, namely also supporting Maine's um, uh, commercial fishing industry, as well as our, our important environment. And so as we think about ways that we want to explore and, and, and advance offshore wind, a key part of that is thinking about how existing um, economic uh, uh, powerhouses like the fishing industry and our, our way of life can be sustained as we advance um, offshore wind. So what does this work look like? We are, are doing a number of planning efforts in terms of the roadmap I'll talk about in a moment. In terms of how Maine's ports could, could help support the offshore wind industry, Department of Transportation is embarking on a stakeholder process related to that. We're also supporting research and innovation. The university is on track to have the first full-scale um, floating turbine in state waters in Maine in 2024. This will be the first in the U.S and has uh, a long history of over a decade of work in terms of leading on floating offshore wind technology, which is required in the Gulf of Maine. And then on the policy and legislative side, uh, we've, we have support for a, a small scale research project in, in federal waters that the state is in the early stages of planning. In addition to that, the, state, the legislature um, has invested in a research consortium to make sure that we can explore how to best coexist, um, have offshore wind energy coexists in the Gulf, Gulf of Maine, and then also prioritizing federal waters, so beyond three miles. And then a key part of that is uh, partnering. And we, we are working um, both informally and formally to uh, make sure that we are, are, are taking lessons learned from other jurisdictions and communities about how to um, advance, advance floating technology and advance uh, offshore wind in, in, in the state of Maine. So in terms of how we are doing that, um, the roadmap was a key pillar that we, uh, we, we launched the roadmap in um, July of, of, of last year. And the reason why we wanted to do this is really to have a building on the over a year, uh, decade of work that we've been doing in the state. How do we kind of map the future for how to advance this, this industry? So we have a, um, uh, over $2 million from the US Economic Development Administration that is helping it put together a comprehensive economic development plan that allows for um, coexistence with Maine's coastal heritage, existing ocean users, but also providing this economic opportunity. And so we set up this advisory committee uh, that includes both public and private sector leaders, as well as four working groups focused on different sectors of the industry. And we're grateful for the participation of Maine Audubon um, in, in this, in this expert, uh, one of the expert working groups. And so the working groups have been working hard over the last months, putting together um, initial recommendations, working with some of them have been working with consultants to help put together technical documents and plans about how, um, about what is needed and the priorities associated with uh, offshore wind in Maine. And so just to give you a sense, we've had over nearly a hundred people participating 
over 50 meetings. All of these are open to the public. And so we invite you to participate at any level that you are interested in, um, whether it's this uh, webinar or in more detail if you're interested. And then also we have a number of technical re reports that are, um, are, are helping the roadmap um, um, in terms of um, uh, guidance and also supporting the recommendations that we're moving forward. In terms of how, where we are in the process, so we launched in July. We're at this first initial stage where this is the first time we're having conversations with people like you to tell you about what the work it is that we're doing, get that feedback, and then we'll be putting together a, um, a, another draft recommendations and final rep and draft report that will go out for public comment again, and we'll finalize it by the end of um, December 2022. And a key part of this is obviously working to um, in, be inclusive through our process and open to feedback about how we can meet, meet reach others and have a, a broad, as broad of an effort as possible. I wanna just kind of preview, uh, share a little bit about some of the rec recommendations for the um, three of the working groups, and then I'll let others go into more detail on the um, uh, uh, environment working group. So I'm co-chair of the Energy Markets and Strategies Working Group along with Jeremy Payne from Renewable Energy uh, uh, Association. And this group is really focusing on three key areas. Um, these, are, these are pretty high level notes right here online. I'll give you a link later, has a little bit more detail if you're interested in delving in. But really we think it's important to establish and initiate an offshore wind requirement and procurement process. The state of Maine will, will need um, offshore wind over the long term. So thinking about how to procure and set up a, a, a clear strategy for um, bringing that offshore wind to the state of Maine. Next one is, is um, making sure that we do this in a cost-effective manner. Right now, the uh, floating technology is fairly new and the cost is declining rapidly, but we wanna make sure that we are smart about um, getting the um, affordable, cost-effective renewable energy for the state. And then the last one is, uh, uh, pursuing regional collaboration in the in the industry, um, whether it is um, procurement, transmission, workforce, supply chain, or environmental issues, it's important that we're considering how not only main mains of use, but also how we can work with New Hampshire, Massachusetts to have a regional approach to uh, the, the this this industry. I'm not going to go through. Um, this full list, read it all, but the uh, fisheries working group, it's an active group chaired by Meredith Mendelson from the um, uh, Department of Marine Resources, as well as Terry Alexander, who's a ground fisherman from Maine. And fishing uh, fishermen in, uh, have been coming to the table and along with fishing associations to talk about um, key priorities associated with, um, with, with potential for offshore wind. And just because people are participating does not mean that they are supportive of offshore wind or this effort, but we're really appreciative of people coming to the table to share ideas about how to minimize impacts and, and maximize benefits. So um, I encourage you to just kind of read through these and see some key areas where uh, we're looking at how to um, make sure that we're, we're doing this in a, in a safe and responsible manner. And so these are still in our development here, but just to give you a sense of what they are. And then the last one is the supply chain workforce development, uh, ports and marine transportation. And this is a very large group that has um, three subgroups, one focusing on supply chain, one on workforce and another on ports. And so uh, the, these are just a, a, a snapshot of the recommendations that they are working through, including how to um, advance supply chain opportunities for companies of all sizes in Maine. From a workforce standpoint, the state has been doing a, a lot of work to advance uh, clean energy workforce efforts, as well as working with our partners. Um, and then lastly, on the port side, uh, the Department of Transportation is leading efforts related to stakeholder engagement and also looking at um, other aspects, whether it be um, how to support working water, waterfronts, um, at pursuing federal funding, and realizing um, the role that main ports can play in the broader offshore wind industry. So those are, that was a quick overview. Um, and so here at the bottom, you can see a link um, that you can read the full recommendations as well as um, we are accepting comments through April 30th, as Nick mentioned, and we are happy to have comments of any that can be detailed or, or with more or less detail as you see fit, really interested in your thoughts about how we can uh, uh, 
make this process better, how we can improve these recommendations to ensure that we have a sustainable offshore wind industry for years to come in the state of Maine. So with that, I'll turn it back to Nick and happy to answer questions later. Excellent. Selena, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you are doing to make sure that offshore wind is done with every important consideration thought of in advance. I really appreciate it. And so now, uh, again, if you have questions for Selena, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we can find along the bottom of your screen. And so now I'm going to uh, turn to Sarah Haggerty to um, give some more specific information on her working group, um, the one that Selena did not cover, and the one that is perhaps most relevant to Maine Audubon's interests. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Nick. Let me just share my screen. Looks good. Thank you. Um, so as uh, thanks, Nick, for the introduction and thanks, Selena, for that great overview of the roadmap and the roles of the, the different working groups. I'm going to, I sit on the Environment and Wildlife Working Group, and so I want to walk you through how we're looking at these things and, and what we're considering and then go through our initial recommendations. So our working group is charged with identifying best practices, data gaps, and research needs to avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts of offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine on wildlife and to address broader environmental impacts to habitat. It's a pretty broad um, requirement that we are working under. So um, we're really fortunate that the folks who are on the working group are experts in the field and that it's a real variety of folks who are involved. We are chaired, our, our group is co-chaired by John Perry of the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Wing Goodale of Biodiversity Research Institute. And then the working group itself is made up of um, folks from federal agencies, state agencies, academia, other NGOs like Maine Audubon. Um, I'm particularly happy that National Audubon is with us as well on the working group because not only do they bring biological information, but they've been working um, to, they've been working with all the different states along the Eastern seaboard and actually um, around the, the country to address impacts to wildlife from offshore wind. And so they bring in a perspective of process that, that many of us here in Maine don't have. So it's really great to have National Audubon on the working group as well. And Selena mentioned the other working groups that are out there. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap between all the different working groups. For us in particular, we have more overlap with the fisheries working group because they're looking at impacts to wildlife and, and habitats as well. And we actually have a little overlap with the group working on ports because we're trying to think about all of the impacts on the environment and that includes the infrastructure development that will support offshore wind. So I borrowed this diagram from Wang from BRI because I think it's such a great snapshot of, of all of the things that we are looking at. We're looking at all the different habitats that could be impacted from the benthic environment where, you know, how will the anchors impact the seafloor to the water column. We're gonna have cables in the water column. Um, we're gonna have electromagnetic fields. We're gonna have noise. Um, how is that impacting wildlife? Then we're thinking about the surface of the water with um, impacts from turbulence and boat traffic, and then we're thinking about the, the air column above, um, above the, the top of the water and impacts to birds and bats from collision or avoidance and displacement. So we're thinking about all of those different habitats, including the impacts of the cable going to shore and where it lands, where it comes to landfall. Um, we're also looking at all of the different aspects of offshore wind development, from siting to construction, through operation all the way through to decommissioning. We're looking at the different impacts that we'll see, we expect to see and how we can um, minimize those impacts through our recommendations. We're also looking at all types of species. Of course, we're looking at birds and bats, but also marine mammals, fish and invertebrates. And we're trying to look at all of the potential impacts, both negative and positive, and that could be collision, displacement, noise, electromagnetic fields, um, increased boat traffic, changes to water stratification, we're trying to think about all the potential impacts that can happen from this much needed renewable energy source. And we're also trying to keep the big picture in mind as well. Climate change is already here and we're already seeing the impacts on 
wildlife and habitats in the Gulf of Maine. So we need to make sure that our data are up to date. We can't be relying on data that maybe are 30 years old and, and maybe aren't applicable anymore. Um, and we also need to think about the cumulative impacts of offshore wind. It's not just in the Gulf of Maine. Um, the map on the right shows the wind energy areas that BOEM has already identified off the eastern, the, the northeast. So a lot of the species that, that we're concerned about in um, the Gulf of Maine or that we're thinking about migrate up and down the eastern seaboard. And so we need to think about the impacts that they'll be seeing from other um, offshore wind projects, which gets to Selena's point of about really thinking about this beyond um, the borders of Maine and even beyond the Gulf of Maine. It's really a collaborative process we need to be doing. So we have worked since last summer and come up with our draft initial recommendations. We have five primary recommendations and these are really the immediate needs that we see. These are things that we need to be working on right now. And we're continuing our meetings and discussions to go through additional areas of, um, of concern. Um, but these are the ones that really need to be addressed right now and I'll walk through them. So um, both our working group and the fishing work, fisheries working group very quickly came to the um, determination that we need to do a mapping exercise. We need to collect all the data that are out there. Um, and there is a Northeast Ocean data portal. So we can pull data from there, um, work with the fisheries working group to get their information on the, the most important fisheries areas, because those are, those are wildlife species and, and habitats we're interested in as well. Um, pull them all together into, into a mapping product and then make sure that we have additional experts bringing their data sets, bringing their area of expertise to, to review and evaluate and, and work on these maps. And we need to make sure that we're setting up the process so that as new data come in, we're able to, um, to create iterations of the map that are as we get more and more informed from, from new data. And so we need to make sure that it's not a static map, that it's a map that we're continually adding to. Some of the types of data that we're interested in pulling together include information on foraging areas for marine birds, particularly the ones that are vulnerable, most vulnerable to collision and displacement. Um, we wanna look at migratory pathways of both birds and bats. Um, in particular, we're looking at coastal islands, the areas around them and between them. We need to be gathering data on important areas for endangered species, for deep water corals and other unique types of habitats and um, species guilds. And we want to make sure that we're incorporating important spawning and feeding areas for fish and other species within the Gulf. And uh, we really want to try and understand areas of aggregation of Calanus copepods. This is one of the most prolific um, organisms in the, in the ocean and they are the foundation of the food web. So when we can find, figure out where they are and what the important features are for them, that will lead us to important areas for higher trophic levels as well. Our second recommendation is to collect habitat data. This is really about the physical um, parts of the Gulf of Maine. We need to work with federal and state agencies to make sure that we are mapping the Gulf and we, that we understand what the seafloor looks like, um, get some high resolution sonar data, LIDAR data. Um, this is a, a really big effort. Our bathymetry data, uh, the vast majority of it is from like the 50s. And so we really need to update the data that we have um, and use the newer tools that are available to us to get more precise data. Um, this is a big effort that requires um, Co cooperation between the, the feds and the state for funding to get the mapping done. Third, we wanna be collecting Gulf of Maine baseline biological data. Um, we want to understand what's going on above and below the water so that we have baseline information before any development happens. We wanna understand nocturnal use of the airspace by both songbirds and shorebirds in migration and, and other movement times. And again, we want that collaboration with New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and we're all looking for the same sort of data. So let's be efficient and work together to collect it. And again, we need funding from both the federal agencies and state agencies. Our fourth recommendation is, is more collection of biological data is to have tracking studies. We would need to know where species are and how they're using and moving through the Gulf of Maine. And that can be from a variety. So it's a variety of species that, that we can use a variety of tracking tools on from MODIS, which um, can be used to track 
birds and bats and insects. Um, and we need more MODIS towers to capture offshore wind areas or offshore areas. We can use GPS to track birds, radar and acoustics to track birds, bats and marine mammals, um, fish tagging. There are a couple of different kinds of marine mammal tracking um, methodologies out there. And, and these sorts of data sets can be the baseline foundations for our understanding of our um, monitoring needs going forward from the pre-construction, during construction, and post-construction. And our fifth recommendation is a little bit wonky. It is about regulatory oversight and cooperative actions between the federal agencies and the state agencies. So the Coastal Zone Management Act requires that there be federal consistency between uh, the federal agencies and the state agencies. I'm not an expert on this, but I've been doing a lot of reading on it. And basically it says that if there's any action that a federal agency will take, whether it's in the coastal zone or, or not, if it will have an impact on the coastal zone, they need to um, undergo a federal consistency review where they need to make sure that whatever they're doing can meet the requirements of the state um, regulatory agencies and within the, the coastal zone. So this is something, offshore wind is sort of new in the federal consistency reviews uh, because we don't have offshore wind yet. So we want to work with our neighbors who are a little bit ahead of us in the process and um, so that we can all um, work together to figure out the best, strongest tools to use to make sure that our, that our state agencies have a strong voice in um, making sure that any offshore wind activities have the, the least impact on our environment and, and wildlife. And one of the, the parts of this is to really take a look at what policies we already have, policies and regulations, because um, we, we may need to incorporate new regulations specifically to look at potential impacts for offshore wind. And we need to, as part of federal consistency, we need to understand the state's role in the cable route review, where that cable is going to go, how it's going to make landfall, and how we can um, make sure that it has the least impact on the environment. So that's a whirlwind tour of our five immediate um, priorities right now, our recommendations, but we're still meeting, we're still discussing a lot of things. There's a lot more to dive into. We're looking at that transmission cable route, um, where landfall will be. Um, we're also trying to develop some best management practices so that every offshore wind project has to meet the same BMPs and data standards for monitoring going forward so that we can have consistency. And again, that's a great place for collaboration with our neighbors. Um, we also need to look at mitigation requirements. There will be impacts. We're going to work really hard to make sure that they're the, the smallest impacts to the environment, but where there are impacts, we need to make sure that there's um, significant mitigation that, that actually offsets the harm. And we want to look at where what the role of procurement can play in um, making sure that there are strong requirements to protect the environment as offshore wind is developed in the Gulf of Maine and um, and then having input from the Maine Offshore Research Consortium and also there's a regional wildlife science collaborative for offshore wind as well. So there are um, entities out there who are looking at this and we need to make sure that we're um, looking both locally and with our neighbors. We're also looking at how do we address those cumulative impacts along the eastern seaboard, um, except for off of Block Island, there, there aren't any wind um, farms there yet, so it's hard to, to figure out what those cum cumulative impacts will be. We need to make sure that our data standards are consistent across all of offshore wind projects so that they can, um, we can learn from any project that goes in, even if it's not in the the Gulf of Maine. And we also need to make sure that the data coming out of any research on any offshore wind project is available to the public so that we can learn and, um, and work together to make sure that we have the smallest impacts. And then we're also talking about what the role of new technologies could be. Um, there, when, when we find new technologies that are actually effective in reducing harm to, the, to wildlife and the environment, we need a way to, to make sure that's incorporated into new projects and whether it's um, there's a, a mechanism for um, sort of adaptive management to incorporate new technologies into existing projects as well. So there's a lot of topics that, and exciting and interesting topics that we're still um, discussing. So that's a quick whirlwind tour. Um, these are the five recommendations that we have for our initial recommendations. And I'm gonna turn it over to Eliza who can go into the process for commenting.
Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and let me get to screen sharing. Hold on. All right, let me just confirm that what folks are seeing, um, it, it has main offshore wind initiative in the top left corner. Can maybe Nick, can you give me a, a yes or no on that? Yeah, it looks good, Eliza. Great. Thanks so much. Well, hello again, everybody. I'm Eliza Donahue, Director of Advocacy for Main Audubon. Big thanks to, to Sarah and Selena for great presentations. Um, as you have all seen, a ton of work has gone into developing this roadmap to date. Um, and as Nick noted, and as Celine noted, and Sarah too, uh, there is an opportunity for folks to offer feedback on the recommendations that Sarah just presented. And we encourage everyone to offer feedback, particularly feedback on the recommendations from the Environment and Wildlife Working Group. Um, not only will your feedback strengthen the recommendations, but they'll also demonstrate the desire of Maine people to be engaged in this important work. However, we also recognize that this is a lot to take in and it's pretty technical stuff. So I'm gonna briefly share with you both how to offer feedback um, and offer some notes on the feedback that Maine Audubon has submitted um, on the Environment and Wildlife Working Group recommendations um, should our organizational notes align with or inspire your own. So I have here um, that screen sharing the easy to use online form that the roadmap has created for people to offer feedback on. There is one of these for each of the working groups. And I've also put it in the chat there um, if folks want to link to it to themselves. themselves. The form is, is quite straightforward. Um, it includes four questions. Um, and the first, all of them relate to uh, the five different recommendations uh, that Sarah went through so carefully. Uh, and the first two are, are pretty straightforward and just involve some check marks. Uh, and that first question asks the reader to pick the two environment and wildlife working group recommendations that they believe to be the most strategically important for Maine right now. So Maine Audubon believes that each of the five recommendations are really crucial. However, for the sake of the exercise, um, in our response, we selected uh, collect the Gulf of Maine baseline data. That's the second one right here, um, as well as conduct tracking studies right down here. So as Sarah described, there exists significant wildlife and habitat Data, data gaps that really need to be closed prior to developing offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. It's imperative that we close those data gaps, that we um, utilize uh, federal funding opportunities, state funding opportunities, collaborate with both um, with BOEM, other federal entities, and with other states uh, to close those gaps so that very thoughtful siting decisions can be made. So that's question one. The second question asks, which are the two lowest priority recommendations for Maine? So again, uh, Maine Audubon views each of the recommendations as crucial, but again, for the sake of the, um, of the exercise, uh, you know, we selected map the existing data and explore use of federal consistency. Again, both of these are incredibly crucial. However, um, we have seen that there's pretty good momentum, particularly towards that first recommendation, mapping existing data, uh, perhaps doesn't need as much um, of a push. And then uh, arguably that exploring the use of federal consistency, um, it very much is important that that gets underway right now, but one could argue um, that it is not quite as immediate as the other recommendations uh, that have been offered by the Environment and Wildlife Working Group. So the third and fourth questions are the ones where uh, we get to be more creative. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you some of the notes um, that, that Maine Audubon has passed along. So that third question asks, 
how the reader would improve or add to the initial recommendations. Um, and in our response, we urged the Environment and Wildlife Working Group to include recommendations on the topics that Sarah described at the end of her presentation, those additional topics for discussion. We're very hopeful that those elements are included in the final product um, created um, uh, in the final roadmap, roadmap product. Uh, you know, for example, best management practices for pre and post constructed post construction monitoring and mitigation requirements. These things are essential for understanding how offshore wind development can coexist with wildlife in the Gulf. So we wanna make sure that these initial recommendations um, that, that Sarah has gone through today, um, they are accompanied by even more recommendations that not only get us to the point of developing uh, offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine, but also help us effectively uh, develop, go through the actual development and operation of offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine in a manner that avoids and minimizes impacts to wildlife and the environment. We also included in our, uh, in our recommendations, uh, the want for consistent data collection. Um, Sarah spoke about uh, the fact that there is going to be offshore wind development up and down the East Coast. For us to really understand um, the impact of species that call the entirety of the eastern seaboard their home, we need to make sure that we're able to kind of share and compare data um, across different projects um, and again up and down the, the coast. And then finally, um, as new wildlife and habitat impact reduction technologies and information become available, uh, again, you know, Sarah has, has shared that there are some places um, farther south uh, on the eastern seaboard that are farther ahead of Maine. We have the opportunity to learn a lot from those projects. We're hopeful that any of that learning and the new technologies that are developed as, res uh, as a result of those projects are adopted by projects in the Gulf of Maine. Not only new projects, but hopefully existing projects as well. Um, I'm really excited about some of the technologies that I've learned about um, that help uh, us help people understand just how uh, birds in particular and then wildlife generally are interacting with these turbines. So the fourth and last question asks for other information or ideas that may be useful to the roadmap. Um, and, you know, in our in our answer to this, um, you know, we gave a, a pretty high level answer and that's that we, Maine Audubon is, is very encouraging that Maine people and decision makers move swiftly towards embracing offshore wind that is not only cited, operated and studied with wildlife and habitat in mind, but offshore wind that is also cost-effective and that utilizes the skills and resources of Maine people. You know, while of course Maine Audubon's focus um, when it comes to offshore wind is the intersection of offshore wind and wildlife, uh, as well as the role that offshore wind can play in helping Maine meet its renewable energy goals, we know that if offshore wind is going to work for Maine, it's going to work for the nation, it needs to work for all Maine people. That means creating jobs for Maine people, that means um, reasonable electricity rates. That means utilizing technology developed here in the state of Maine. Um, many other aspects that are going to, again, um, play to the real um, sweeping benefits of offshore wind that are beyond, you know, what are some of the most paramount benefits, and that is reducing our reliance on, on fossil fuels. So that's a whirlwind um, of uh, of the feedback um, opportunity. Again, it, this is, I put the link in the chat. Um, it'll, that link will take you to this page that I have right here. I'm gonna stop uh, screen sharing and encourage folks to, to give feedback before uh, April 30th. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Eliza, and thank you to Sarah and Selena. I'm wondering if um, Sarah and Selena could 
uh, start their video for the Q&A portion, put you on the spot here. Thank you very much. Um, amazing stuff. Thank you so much. Um, and to the folks listening, you know, this is how we make sure it's done right, right? I mean, um, this is, uh, you know, Maine Audubon believes that offshore wind can be a way to get off fossil fuels, but we know that there may be impacts and we need to um, make sure it's done right. This is how we do it, is by um, sending in your recommendations and making our voices heard. So I encourage you all to um, click the link that Eliza put together. Um, I'll be sending out some information later on to attendees and to many other Maine Audubon members about um, uh, our recommendations for making comments here. So um, please take heed and take action. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to questions. Um, again, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we'll get started. Um, although I do know that there were some um, up in the chat and I'll start with those, one from John. Um, and I'm not sure who would wanna take this, uh, maybe Selena, maybe Sarah, but um, can, John asked, can you put in better perspective how much energy could be generated from offshore wind? Uh, perhaps a number of residences or some other figure that um, can translate. Sure. So if you have a one uh, 12 megawatt uh, turbine offshore. That's about 7,000 homes. If you had a 150, 156 uh, megawatt project, that's about 100,000 homes. And if, if you're getting to 156 gigawatts, that's 100 million homes. Um, so there is a lot of energy in the Gulf of Maine. And correct me if I'm wrong, there are not 100 million homes in Maine. So this would be a significant energy source, not just for Maine, but for the, the nation. Correct? Yes, and it's just to, to illustrate the potential. Um, our, we have uh, far less in terms of our actual energy needs here. So, so it's a big deal. Um, Ronald asks, uh, you'd mentioned some concerns from the fishing industry. Um, he's wondering if you could summarize those concerns. I can share a few thoughts. I, I don't want to speak for the fishing industry. So just in terms of what I can share that I, I have heard. Um, I think what number one is on a process side, the way that the fishing industry is regulated is very different than the way that offshore wind is, is planned and regulated. And so um, making sure that the fishing industry have a, a seat at the table and are able to provide input pro pro early on in the process, I think is an important component. And then thinking about um, through each stage of the um, de development of the project. So whether it's your transmission cable interconnecting to shore, how that may interact with fishing activity, or a project offshore, whether it's possible to uh, fi uh, fish around the, the project and whether the fishing, fishermen feel comfortable where those projects are sited are, is incredibly important to the fishing industry. That's just a few, Sarah and Eliza may also have, have thoughts, but that's what comes to mind. Thank you. I was just gonna say one of the, the big pieces that we're hearing from the fishing industry is um, to make sure that we have really good communication, that that they're being heard and that um, that they're understanding what what's going on and 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 throughout the entire process beforehand, during and and after as well. Great. Um, a couple of questions about birds that I'd like to direct to Sarah, if possible. One from Jeff about. Um, what do we know from other offshore wind installations about the potential impact on migratory birds? And then from Lance, uh, what are some ideas about how the impacts on birds could be monitored as you go forward? Yeah, there's, there, um, there actually is a lot of information out there from offshore wind in Europe. Um, it is a little bit different. The turbines that were put in, they've been out there for a couple of decades now, and they're not quite as tall as the turbines that we're going to end up with and their monopile. So we're going to have floating um floating turbines here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and so there will be some differences there, but but research is showing that some species just act like they're not there. It's totally fine. Um, some species are more vulnerable to collision and some species actually will avoid the turbines. And so we need to think about um, what those species are in particular. Um, so think 
terns and gulls, when you think about collisions, you know, they're, they're flying higher, they're, they're moving a lot more, um, less so for puffins who are staying a little closer to the, the surface of the water. Um, but any impact on the, um, the food sources that are in the, in the marine environment is something that could affect the birds as well. And so those are some of the things that, that folks are thinking about. The distance between the turbines can affect the displacement effect. Some species will move between them if, there's, if they're far enough apart. Um, some will go around the entire array. And so we need to, to understand what's happening here with um, the turbines that will end up here. Um, and was the second part on how to, how to minimize and avoid those or how to track them? And, and monitor. And monitor. Yeah, so um, so we're looking at things like like radar to get a feel for. So um, I think folks often will think about marine birds, but we also have to remember that songbirds and shorebirds migrate and some of them will stay along the coast, but many will cut across the Gulf of Maine. So we need to understand a little bit better. And that's where the, the tracking can come in to understand um, who's who's moving where when. And it's not just across the, the Gulf of Maine, it's also within the airspace, right? The air column, how high up are they moving? It may be, um, may not have any effect at all if they're all flying well below the, the, the rotor sweep zone. But the weather can have a role on that too. When the weather is bad, they can be pushed down into the rotor sweep area instead of flying above them. So there, there's a lot of different stuff to look at and a lot of different technologies. Um, and then there are some, Eliza and I both talked a little bit about new technologies. There's some technology that's being looked at. It's still very, very early um, to look at um, how to track actual collisions, whether it's with a bird or a bat um, and, and how to understand what's leading to those collisions as well. Great. Thanks. We have a bunch of questions coming in. I'll, I'll take one from Carol Jean quickly, who asked about solar. What about solar? Um, just to say that Maine Audubon strongly supports uh, the use of solar renewable energy in Maine uh, on roofs and in, in other contexts. Um, Sarah's hat, I don't want to speak for her, but her other hat, her onshore hat, um, does a lot of work with solar siting in Maine. And she recently released um, the uh, a solar siting um, tool, which is a GIS tool to help towns and uh, other groups figure out where solar might work and uh, certainly places to avoid. And so, yeah, we're strong supporters of solar um, uh, um, in a lot of contests, especially on your roof, if possible. Question from Barbara, who asks, um, what do we see as the most likely obstacles to Mainers embracing offshore wind, um, especially as there are various points of pushback. Do folks want to take a stab at that? Or are, are, are other, you know, areas of hurdles so far? You want to start, Sarah? I'll go for it. I mean, I think number one is um, having conversations like this, sharing information about the potential and the process and um, what it can mean for Maine. Two, I think it is um, good policies that support home um, opportunities for main companies, um, economic opportunities for young people. Um, and to, to, those are a few thoughts. I also think that a lot of people are supportive of offshore wind. And then th I think the last point would be to the, the concerns raised by um, fishing industry and others is having a process that um, is workable and continues to be in the communications point on Sarah's, Sarah's point is I think really good. So um, I'd say that we are taking steps to move in the right direction and need to continue to do this um, for the years to come. Sarah, I'm not sure if you wanna add anything. No, I think, I think that covered it really well. I think um, your first point is the most important one that I'm um, getting information out there. And, and this is new, this is brand new. We don't know what the impacts will be, but there are places where we can learn before it, it hits the ground. And so just making sure that we are communicating what we do know, what we don't know, and, and um, working with the best information that we, that we have. Um, I just got a text from Eliza. We have lost Eliza. That's okay. Uh, she is okay. Our internet is out. We are in the middle of a storm. I'm surprised. I'm glad we made it this far in. So um, thanks to Eliza and, and good luck with getting your internet back. Um, Ted asked a quick question about UMaine. This is a really exciting sort of piece of the puzzle we haven't mentioned here. Um, Selena, perhaps you could talk about um, how UMaine is involved here. 
Yeah, I mean, the U Maine is, uh, University of Maine, Dr. Habib Dagger and the Composite Center has done a tremendous amount of work and continues to really lead in terms of floating technology. They've put in the water off the coast of Maine, I think it was in 2008, a one eighth scale um, floating technology, um, have patents, a number of patents to support that and planning the, the a project um, in targeted for 2024 in state waters. And so they have a long history. They are very good partners of the state and will continue to and, and I think um, have big grander plans too, to advance the, the technology. And that's another thing is that um, using those concrete um, foundations um, creates more local jobs here. And so um, we've been supportive of their, their effort to date um, and excited about their, their work. Awesome, thanks. Um, Juanita asks, and um, if you could quickly just um, discuss the working group talking about um, ports and sort of how the, um, you know, uh, how that's gonna work or, or what some of the recommendations are. You did cover it in your slide and may have missed it. But. Sure, and so, so when you're thinking about building these offshore wind turbines are, are big and you need a lot of physical space to uh, manufacture, assemble and, uh, and deploy offshore wind. And so whenever you're thinking about offshore wind, you need to think about where are you gonna build this? And so, the um, Department of Transportation has done an initial assessment of the Port of Sears Port, as well as taking a look at other ports and how they can support different aspects of the advancement of the industry. Um, DOT uh, has a working uh, a, a stakeholder group that they've launched to talk through some of those details in more in more detail. And I believe Eliza or Maine Audubon is is part of that to understand from a, a wildlife perspective, from a bird perspective, um, potential. Um, uh, impacts and how to reduce those. That's right. And those recommendations are on the same timeline, uh, April 30th, is that correct? That the, and folks could find on the website? Yeah, for Not, the port. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the port conversation is longer than that, but if initial recommendations, happy to take comments by April 30th. Great. Um, Sarah, I'm wondering if you uh, want to take a question about whales and marine mammals, and maybe a quick summary of what the potential issues are and what folks are thinking about um, for recommendations or mitigations. Yeah, um, marine mammals, it's a, it's a big topic, really important topic. Um, and some of the issues that we're thinking about are any changes to the habitats, the, the marine habitats that might affect their food sources. Um, you know, the, there will be cables in the water from the floating turbines. And so there is a question, the cables are huge. They're gonna be like tree trunks. So we're not worried about entanglement from the cables themselves, but if there are, you know, old, um, Fishing, fishing lines or, or nets that can get entangled on the cables, it, is there a secondary um, entanglement risk? So they're looking at ways to make sure that those cables stay clean. Um, potential impacts from electromagnetic fields, although that doesn't seem to be as big an issue for um, marine mammals as it is potentially for other species. Um, the potential for noise. Um, the floating turbines has one benefit compared to the monopile in that when the monopiles are put in, there's a lot of um, blasting and drilling that has to happen. And it's very, very loud. And, and during construction, um, it's a huge concern for marine mammals. And so the floating turbines don't have that, but there is um, noise generated by the functioning of those turbines. And there are different ways to reduce that noise. So that's one of the things that um, there were, we're recommending be looked into to sort of um, keep the noise all up, up above um, or just reduce it um, completely. Um, and I, and, and the other thing that we need to remember is that um, climate change is changing things already. And so it's hard to know what those impacts will be. So we, we really need to make sure that we keep collecting the data over time. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat about offshore, the floating technology and how it stands up to strong winds, hurricanes, um, other events like that. Um, can can you speak to that and sort of um, talk about, you know, what it looks like under uh, extreme conditions? Yeah, and the University of Maine has a, a, a test uh, pool that they've been they've been using to, to test their technology. Um, the the University of Maine uh, technology, I think, has been tested for it to withstand 500 year uh, storms. And so it is an important component of any planning from an engineering standpoint. And um, so far, the, the, the testing is going well for the university. 
Great. Um, we'll take, I think, two more questions down here before we jump out. And we're, I want to re re reiterate the link that Eliza uh, put in the chat before. Um, a question from, well, this is maybe a sort of a combined question from Barbara and Lindy. Um, are there other uh, oceanic renewable energy technologies under consideration, like offshore solar, uh, interesting, or current, or other types of wind generators? Is um, this this turbine style is is the best, or what? There are other renewable offshore renewable technologies. There is tidal. There is wave. There's solar world. We've seen some some investigation of that worldwide. Um, at, one thing I, I'll just briefly say is that the federal government is start is in the very early stages of planning for leasing associated with offshore renewable energy um, in the Gulf of Maine. And part of that will be collecting data, whether there's anyone interested in pursuing anything uh, uh, beyond offshore wind, but primarily our focus has been um, for far offshore uh, on, on offshore wind. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it there with the questions. Thank you so much. And apologies to the ones we didn't get to. I wanted to circle. Oh, that's not the right link that I just put down there. Um, sorry about that. Um, if you're interested in avian flu, I don't know why that that um, came in on my link. Um, I, uh, let me try doing that again. I'm, I want to recopy. Uh, this is not working. It's not letting me recopy the link. Um, so if you scroll up away from that and a couple um, up in the chat, uh, you can see the comment that Eliza put in there with a link to where you can um, add your comments. I want to reiterate how important it is to share our voice, to share our voice on behalf of wildlife and the environment uh, in, as we move forward here. There's a lot of voices in the room, as was alluded to, and we need to make sure that ours is heard. And so um, um, you'll be getting some more information from me about uh, what Eliza uh, recommended for um, how to comment, and we strongly encourage you to do so. I want to thank Selena Cunningham. Thank you for joining us and for all the work you, you're doing. Sarah, thank you. And Eliza, thank you in absentia as, uh, as your internet is gone. And thank you all for joining. It's really uh, nice to see people's interest in this topic as we move forward. This is a very exciting development uh, for Maine and we um, hope that um, we can help uh, the environment and the earth. Thanks all and we'll talk soon. Thank, thank you. you.